Good morning. That's week four of this series, Crowns. Man, I've enjoyed being a part of it. I got to kick it off a few weeks ago. Jeremy did a phenomenal job last week, Neil the week before him. And I'm excited to be with you guys this morning and sharing the word that I feel like God has placed upon my heart for you guys. So if you have your copy of God's Word with you, you can go ahead and be turning to 2 Timothy chapter 4 will be verses 1 through 8 this morning. I uh, Recently we were over at some friend's house and on the wall they had framed the final words, it was a quote, the final words of a man that had had a significant impact in their life and I was reminded that final words from People who have lived lives of significance can carry extraordinary weight. And today, as we look at the crown of righteousness, we find this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. It is, as far as uh, the canon of Scripture goes, the final words of one of the most significant men that uh, lived, the Apostle Paul. And he is writing these final words, and it's... It's an intimate letter. If we look at it today and we say, well, this is the Word of God. This is the Bible. Second Timothy is one of the books of the Bible. But in fact, it was a letter written from Paul to Timothy. And Paul knew that his days were numbered, that his time on this earth, his ministry was coming to an end. So it's a very intimate document, especially chapter 4 is a very intimate um, uh, passage of Paul pouring in to the life of his disciple Timothy before he leaves the scene. And so I believe the Holy Spirit has a profound word and wants to stir in our hearts and lives great things. And it's amazing uh, that the work of the Holy Spirit, how he works, is that he would use this letter and it would become uh, scripture. It was God-breathed, inspired by the Holy Spirit at the time that Paul wrote it. And thousands and thousands of years later, uh, this letter uh, is having a profound impact on the hearts and the lives of the people who are willing to hear it and receive it. I hope that is you this morning. If you have found your place, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll read verses 1 through 8. I'm reading from the ESV, and I believe the words will be on the screen. Paul says to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears they will accumulate for themselves, teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this word. Holy Spirit, you come in our time together and do what only you can do. God, work in the hearts of the lives of the people in this 11 a.m. service, those that are listening online. Bring the revelation that you desire to bring into our hearts and lives and change us and mold us and make us into your image. We love you and we ask these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. What we see really here, and I'm going to spend a lot of time in verse 7 specifically, what we see here. Uh, is Paul is giving a prescription to Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, I, I've, I've got a crown. I've got a crown of righteousness that is, is waiting for me. 
I'm about to be there. I'm about to be uh, awarded this crown. Here is how you get this same crown. So Paul is laying out this prescription. I want us to take a few minutes and just note it and notice it so that we can figure out how to win this crown of righteousness. Number one, I want you to notice in verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. You need to put up a fight. If you are going to win the crown of righteousness, you need to put up a fight. Paul said earlier to Timothy in his first letter, chapter 6, verse 12, he said, fight the good fight of faith. See, Paul, and the reality is where he at, he's at in his uh, ministry is, man, he, he has experienced ministry and realizes that it feels a whole lot like being in a fight. Matter of fact, if you go to the end of that chapter, chapter 4, he's uh, given some instructions to Timothy on what to bring to him when he comes to visit for what will be undoubtedly the final visit. He tells him to beware of Alexander the coppersmith. He says, this man has done me great harm. Paul has experienced the pain of ministry. He has experienced the difficulty of ministry. Of ministry, and the the beauty of it is, is that he's aware of it. He's experienced it. He's he's literally, he's about to stand before one of the most wicked men to ever walk the face of this earth, who in Paul's day had the most power and authority of any man on the face of the earth. Nero, if you know much about your history, you know Nero was a wicked and a perverse man. We can't, even, we can't even talk openly about all of the things that Nero engaged in. He was sadistic. He was sociopathic. He, he murdered for pleasure. He took advantage of the most innocent people on the face of the earth. What he did was horrible. And Paul was there preparing to stand before him and speak a truth that he knew inevitably would cost him his life. And in the midst of being in that place, Paul has been abandoned. He has been forsaken. There are other people out in the early church that are declaring that the fact that Paul is in prison is a sign that God's blessing is not upon his life. They're discounting and undermining his entire ministry. Paul knows what it's like to be in a fight. But if you go to the very end, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he ends his letter talking about the grace of God. Man, I'm telling you, it's a beautiful place to be. It doesn't matter if everyone around you thinks you're standing in defeat. If you are where you know God wants you to be, there is a peace that passes all understanding. There is a joy that can't be robbed, that can't be stolen, that can't be taken. No matter how many lies are told, no matter what is said, it is a beautiful place of peace and rest. Even in the middle of prison, and we see Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, right there, pouring into the life of Timothy through a letter. In the moments that he has left on this earth, he, he knew what it was like to put up a fight. Jeremy preached last week, he preached from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 26, which says, So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. Paul is saying that passage, he's like, I'm not punching the air here. I'm in, I'm in a fight, and I'm making every punch I throw at the enemy count. The reality is, if in the first century Roman world, fighting was a brutal, brutal spectator sport. And, and when two men went into a ring, only one man left out of that ring alive. You could, you could afford to take a punch and you could afford to get knocked down, but you could not afford to get knocked out. Because if you were knocked unconscious, that meant that enemy took your life. You did not wake up. So Paul knew what it was like to take a punch. He knew what it was like to get knocked down, but he refused to be knocked out. He got back up, and he fought the fight. And he's making that de declaration here in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I have fought the good fight. He was a man who embraced the difficulty and grind of being a follower of Jesus. Paul knew that scars of ministry were real. He knew that they were real, but he also knew they were not to be ashamed of. They were to be celebrated. 
They were to be celebrated. Banners declaring the worth of the one that he was fighting for. Man, scars are wounds that are, that are healed. Do we understand that this morning? Some of you, you have scars from your past. They're they're wounds. They were wounds until you encountered the gospel, the loving eyes of a beautiful Savior. And he healed you, but somehow you ran across some religious spirit somewhere along the way that convinced you that you need to conceal the scars from your past. That you you don't need to talk about that. You don't need to talk about what happened in your past and how God healed those wounds. And Paul was saying, no, wounds are real. Scars are real. It means that you have been in a fight. Jesus wants you to know this morning, if you're in the room or you're listening online, man, the things that he's healed you from, yeah, it's It was painful. It was difficult. It left scars. But your scars are beautiful to him. Because it means that your wounds have had an an encounter with him, with his truth. We say it all the time in the life of Element Church. The way God works is he will take your misery and he will turn it into a ministry. Paul's doing it here even in his dying words saying, yeah, I've been, hurt, I've been hurt, I've been wounded, I've been attacked, I've been maimed. But let me tell you about the grace of God. Let me tell you about his goodness. Let me tell you about what's waiting for me, a crown of righteousness, because I have fought the good fight. The implication there is, Timothy, go and do likewise. Beautiful scars. I've shared this story before. It's one of the most profound encounters in my ministry that I've ever been a part of. And it happened uh, at, a, at a young age in my ministry. I was a youth pastor, and I uh, was bivocational. I worked back then Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Sometimes I would change a day for Saturday. But I was always off on Wednesdays in my vocational job and engaged in ministry all day Wednesday and then on Sunday um, and I was approached by the, um, the principal of a Christian school and asked if I would come on Wednesday mornings and do uh, chapel. And I, I really didn't want to because I really enjoyed um, taking a nap. I would take my kids to daycare, just being honest with you, keeping it real here, take my kids to daycare, and I'd go back home and I'd take a nap on Wednesdays. And so um, if I'm going to do chapel, then I'm not going to get as long of a nap. But I agreed. I agreed because I really did. I was at at a place in my life back then that, man, I wanted to be in the fight. I wanted to be in the fight, and I wanted to be faithful in the small things, the opportunities that God brought my way. I wanted to to make the most of them, and I wanted to see his name made famous. And so I I agreed, and I would go to chapel, and I would do chapel services. Side note, and I think I've shared this before too, for a long time, in my mind, I would go to that chapel service because, right, you, you're faithful in small things. He entrusts you with the big things, right? And I remember one day, just I'm a small room, a small group of kids, and the Holy Spirit just shows up. He just shows up in this room. And I was like, I could hear the Lord whisper in my ear, and he goes, this is the big thing. This is the big thing. Man, don't, don't despise the small things or what you think is the small things. Because it may very well be the big thing. You don't know whose life you're having an impact on. But it was one of those days, I come into chapel late, because I probably overslept. And uh, so uh, it happens in your youth, you know. Uh, I'm all past that now. But um, So I come in, and the principal comes to me, and she says, hey, do you have a, do you got a minute after chapel? And I was like, I got a minute to go home and take a nap. Um, exactly what I was thinking. I was like, uh, maybe just a minute, but I've got somewhere I've got to be. You know, you ever done that? It's not a lie, lie, but it's not really the truth. You know, uh, yeah, I've got somewhere I need to be, which I did, back home on my couch taking a nap. And uh, she said, okay, great, great. I've got this kid, and I've been having a lot of problems with him. I'm going to have to suspend him today, and uh, I want you to come in and have a word with him. 
And I was like, okay, what's the word you want me to have with him? You know, like, you got something laid out for me to go over? What's, what's going on? That, that was it. That's all she said. So we did chapel, and I go into her office, and there he is, you know, young punk. He's got the punk lean, you know what I'm talking about? He's sitting in the chair, all punked out, like, not making eye contact, mad that he's in the room. And I've heard, I've heard what he's, you know, he's been having some outbursts, using some foul language. And I got two daughters in this school, and so I'm a little bit like, all right, boy, I'm going to yank a knot in your tail kind of mindset. Uh, I'll be cussing around my girls. Um, but uh, so I go in there and, and sit down, and I'm just like, okay, what am I gonna, how am I going to help this kid out here? And I'm just like, I, I know what it costs for this kid to go to school here because I got two kids in school there. I'm like, this kid's got rich people problems, okay? He's, somebody's paying for him to go to school, you know? And here he is just causing problems, being rebellious. And so I formalize a plan all on my own. Don't need any help from God, right? I got this. And so uh, the principal says, hey, I've asked Jared to come in here to share a few things with you. And she just shuts up and is like dead silence. So I said, hey, man, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm 20-something your old youth pastor, and uh, I said, hey, man, I'm going to ask you a question, but I don't want you to answer. I want you to think about it. Take a minute. Think about it before you answer. What's the most difficult thing you've ever been through in your life? And I've got an idea, you know, what an 11-year-old has been through, maybe some difficult things that he's faced. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to let him give his best answer, and then I'm going to give him some perspective on how difficult the world is and how good he's got it and how blessed he is. And we've just come out of a missions conference. I've never, mind you, been on an international mission trip of my own, but I've been listening in the conference, and so I know that we've got it good in America and things are tough in other parts of the world, and I'm just going to lay all this on there and fix this kid in a few minutes and get home to my nap, right? And uh, so I asked him the question, and an amazing thing happens is he, he gets out of that little thug lean he's in, and he sits up straight, and I'm looking, I'm looking at the principal, I'm looking at him, and she's kind of surprised, he's engaging, he's thinking, and I'm like, man, I know why she invited me to do this, because I'm, I'm good at this, like... <laughs> It was smart of her to ask me to come, right? I'm just telling you, these are the kind of thoughts that were going through my mind. I know it's, it's arrogance, but that's, that's what was going through my mind. And, oh, man, this kid looks up, looks me in the eye, and he goes, J.R., I'd, I'd have to say the hardest thing that I've ever been through is the day that uh, they came to take me away from my dad. And as they were putting me in the car, my dad yelled and said, the worst day of my life is the day that you were born. Gosh. And I remember in that moment just being overwhelmed. And I said, God, how, how could you let this happen to me? What, it, what, what have you let me get myself into? I, I mean, literally, these are the thoughts going on in my mind. I was like, God, this... This, is, this, this kid's been through a horrible situation and he's got wounds that I don't have the ability and the capacity to minister to, to heal. God, he, he, he needs the lead pastor. He needs, he needs a team of lead pastors. God, what, what are we going to do? And I, I'm literally crying out in my spirit, horrified at what I have caused to happen in this room when I have no capacity to fix the problem in this young man's life. And what I can only describe as God's faithfulness, and for me, and it's not trying to embellish this moment or anything, but for me it felt like just like an out-of-body of experience and, and the Holy Spirit just showing up, and I'm, I'm, I know words are coming out of my mouth, but to this day I have no knowledge of what they were, but I know what's going on in the room, and I know there's being tears of pain, and I know there's tears of of joy, and I know the countenance of this young man is changing, and so God is being faithful in my weakness. God is showing up in abundance in my lack. And I can remember as we just come to this moment of like, man, healing is in the room, and it's been happening in this young man's life. And it gets quiet. The principal goes, well, 
I know we need to let JR go. I know he's got somewhere he's got to be. I'm like, shoot. <laughs> oh, man. She says, JR, will not you, won't you pray for this young man before you leave? I'm like, okay. And so I'm sitting in a chair on one side of the room. He's sitting in a chair on the other side of the room. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to take a knee. I get down on the floor, take a knee, and I'm just going to reach over and put my hand on his shoulder and, and pray for this young man. And and I, so I, I reach, but I just miss. You know, I just miss. I miss his shoulder. I don't even. I don't even get his knee I just miss him all together and, and I, I grab his foot I'm like shoot I am holding this kid's foot and uh, I was like how do I fix this and uh, so I thought it would be a good idea and, it, and it, immediately I regretted it I grabbed his other foot Well, the principal's seeing this, so it's okay. Okay, I'm, I got this kid's feet. This is, this is awkward. And, and, and I was just like, Lord, you got you to gotta bail me out of this again. You got to, I don't know what to say. And just as clear as we're sitting here I, and talking, I, I heard the Lord say, tell him he has beautiful feet. I was like, no, Lord. <laughs> There's something else you want me to tell this kid. That is not it, God. That's not it. Or it says, tell him he's got beautiful feet. And so I just said, Ethan, I hear the Lord say you have beautiful feet. And then God reminded me of the passage quoted out of the Old Testament. It's quoted in Romans 10. It says, beautiful are the feet of those who carry the gospel. we just come out of the missions conference, and that had been a theme verse. And So for a minute, I was like, okay, Lord, I see you're redeeming my mistake. And I, and I just quoted that passage, beautiful are the feet of those who carry the gospel, the good news. And I don't know where you're going to go. I don't know what all God has for you, but you're going to carry his gospel and his good news everywhere you go. And I, and I say amen, and... And uh, I get up and I walk out, and I did not go home and take a nap. I went out to my car, and I was just I was just overwhelmed at my own inabilities in that moment, and just how I created this mess. But but also how God was faithful, and I'm just I'm just debriefing with the Holy Spirit, going, "What just happened, Lord? How did I not know what I was walking into? I didn't know what was happening." And my phone rings, it's been 45 minutes or an hour, and it's the principal, and I I'm, I'm think about just letting it go to voicemail, but I just answer the phone, and I just say, hey, I, I'm sorry. And she says, what? for what? It's like, I know, I just blew that right from the get-go. She's like, I, I, I don't think you understand what's happened. And she, she begins to tell me, she says, this young man that, I've been dealing with and that come into the office. Uh, when he left out of there today, he left out a changed young man. And I'm, I was feeling encouraged. And, and uh, then she brought up the feet thing. And I was like, shoot. <laughs> she said, you're, you're not going to believe this. But when I got done, and um, she was a principal, so she did suspend him, okay? <laughs> he got suspended. Uh, and uh, she said, when I was done, I just asked him, I said, Man, what has God taught you through all of this? And she said, Jerry, he looked up at me. He said, listen, I, I know you didn't know this, and I know Jr. didn't know this. But my dad, the reason they took, took me from him is he was abusive. And one of the things that he did to me was he, he poured scalding hot water on my feet. And I have the scars. And I'm always terrified that somebody is going to see my scars. I'm at a friend's house and I, I don't want to have to answer, what happened to your feet? Because I have to say, my dad. My dad did that to me. 
He said, but today I'm walking out of here knowing that Jesus thinks my feet are beautiful. And, man, I, and, and I say that to you today because some of you are missing out because you're not in the fight. I wasn't capable. I wasn't able. I was just there. I was just there. I was in the fight. I was in the place that I was supposed to be. Didn't even have the right mindset. I didn't even have the right attitude. But I was there in the fight and God brought the victory. Some of you are missing out on victories because you think you're not capable. You think you're not able. You think your own scars from your own past disqualify you and they don't. There's nothing that you can do. There's not enough books that you can read. There's not enough classes that you can take that will make you capable and able to minister and to walk in the victories that God has you has for you. You just have to trust him and get in the fight. Church, put up a fight. Get into the fight. Fight the good fight. John chapter 20, verse 20. Jesus is showing up to his disciples. It says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands. And he showed them his side. This is the resurrected body of Christ. Do you understand what that means? This is the glorified, risen from the dead, gone to the Father, walked through walls, ascended into the heavens, body of Christ, and he kept the scars because they're beautiful to him. And somebody here, I mean, the Spirit of God woke me up this morning. And said, dear, there's going to be somebody there that needs to hear the scars from their past are beautiful to me. And I want to use them. I want to use them to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted. Man. And maybe for you this morning, the wounds are still fresh. But you need to understand God has a plan to heal those wounds and to put you into the fight and to use you to defeat the very enemy that caused those scars in the first place. It's just the beauty of how he works. It's who he is and it's what he does. Jesus wants to heal your wounds and use your scars. Will you let him? Will you let him? The author and the finisher of our faith identifies himself by his scars. Man, I'm telling you, there's something more powerful in that message than I can convey in words. The author and the finisher of our faith, resurrected, walking in victory, identifies himself to those who were closest to him by his scars. And some of us are just trying to hide. We don't want people to know the things that God has healed us from. Man, get in the fight. Number two, I want you to notice verse seven. Not only did he, not only did he fight the good fight, but he finished the race. He said, I have finish the race. Philippians 1.6 says, and I'm sure of this, that he who begins a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. How many of you know this morning that we serve a God who finishes what he starts? He finishes what he starts. He finishes it. Man, we need to be a people. Paul is a follower of Christ who's saying, I finished what I started. I finished the race. And he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, go out. There's going to be reasons to give up. There's going to be reasons to stop. But there is a crown of righteousness that is waiting for the one who will finish the race. Rightfully so, rightfully so, my position, because of my position, there are people that corner me, and I'm okay with this. Listen, I want to be very careful in how I convey this because I, I love, I love, love, love when someone has a word from God over their life and they, they share what God is speaking to them, what God is calling to them to. 
Man, I want to I wanna pray with you. I want to pray for you. I want to fan the flame. I want to be excited. But because of my position, one of the things that I've had to, to observe and see over the years is a lot of times people will, they will corner me or they will call me or, and they will, they will, man, they will just be on fire and they will just pour out. Man, God's telling me. He's calling me to this. God said, God said, God said. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. If God said something to you, find me today and tell me. But know this. When I see you in a year, when I see you in two years, and you're not talking about it, I'm going to ask you about it. When you've, when you've walked away or went away from it or quit doing it, I'm going to ask you about it. Because if God said it, you need to do it or die trying. This is the message of the gospel. This is the life of Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I've done it. I'm here at the end. I'm about to lose my life because of it. And I'm still doing it because God said it. I'm going to finish what was started. Man, this world needs a community of believers who are faithful to see finish what God has started in their life. If God said it, do it. Do it. Do it. Neil talked about it a few weeks ago, and rightfully so, of, of a lot of ministers who, who don't think they can burn out and do burn out. But even as he was talking about that, I was thinking about the fact that you know why so many pastors and leaders of ministry burn out? Because all the people that they're surrounded by never get lit up. So they're burning alone. Ecclesiastes says that two is better than one. A three-stranded cord is not easily broken. I have no interest in any kind of superiority model or complex to the life of element, but I'm also not going not to hesitate to say that I am thankful to be a part of a team I am thankful that this is not just about one individual on the stage. I am thankful that there are, there are other people who are burning for him and that I get to burn alongside them. Some of us have not gotten into the fight to begin with. We don't even need to talk about finishing the race for some of you this morning. We need to talk about getting in the race. It is, a, it is a worthy race. It is a worthy fight, and you are called to it. Get into it. Finish the race, but first you have to start the race. I love 2 Samuel, and we've talked about this, the, the, the uh, mighty men of David. Man, if you need some fuel, if you need something to fire you up about what God has called you to, what he's called you to do in your life, go to 2 Samuel. And read some of the stories of these mighty men of David. Second Samuel chapter 23 uh, talks about three of them. One of them is a guy named Eleazar. One cool thing, this is a side note, we were talking about this in the green room between services. Uh, David, three of these guys, they overhear David talking about a whale that he used to drink from as a kid, Right? They're, what they're hearing is, man, our king would like to have a drink of water, but this town, this entire town is occupied by Philistines. It is a Philistine stronghold. So these three guys, they don't tell anybody. They just sneak off, and they bust into the town. They go to the well. They get a cup of water. Somehow they don't spill it as they fight their way out, and they take it back to their king. Why? Because their king was worthy to them. He was worthy to them. I mean, when they heard something that was near and dear to his heart, they wanted to be a part of his pleasure. Come on. Man, do you want to spill out your life, as Paul says, as a drink offering to the pleasure of God's will? Or are you too concerned about your own will? Man, you need to put up a fight. You need to get in the fight. And then you need to finish what has started. I love it. It says Eleazar goes out in chapter 23. He goes out to fight. Um, and the, um, all the other Israeli warriors, they, they all retreat. I feel like the uh, translation puts it nice, nicely. It says, and the men of Israel withdrew. <laughs> they ran. They took tail and they ran. 
But Eleazar is this mighty man who says, no, no, I'm not quitting. I'm not stopping. I know everybody else is running, but I am not running. And it says that he stands his ground. He stands his ground and he fights to the point that his hand is just cramped around the sword. He is worn out. He is exhausted from the fight, but he stands his ground. And there's a powerful verse, 2 Samuel. It says, he rose and he struck down the Philistine until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day. I'm telling you, God, his eyes go to and fro across the land. He's looking for the ones who will be faithful, who will stand and fight. will say, the pleasure of my king is worth it. And he will bring the victory. He will bring the victory, but he's looking for those who will stand and fight. The story was told by a man named Elmer Towns. He's a uh, help co-found... Liberty University, he was the, the dean of their religious program, had the pleasure of uh, sending off a lot of people that came through that seminary program. And one young man back in the 80s, he continued to mentor him, even after he graduated and went into the ministry and just kept up with where he was at and what was going on. And this young man had shared with him this experience. Mr. Towns retells the story well. Uh, this young man took the helm of a large church in downtown Memphis, Tennessee. Big church, an established church. Uh, and he had, uh, shortly upon a revival, a clear vision of why God had called him there and what God had called him to, to lead that church, to lead that church to reach the city. See, it's never about a church. It's always about a city. Come on. It's never about building a church. It's always about reaching the city. And so this was stirring in his heart, and he come in with great excitement and int- anticipation that he was going to uh, get some people out of their comfort zones, <laughs> that he was going to light some flames and get some people to burn alongside with him. And one of the things that he did early in this campaign to get this established traditional church, to get outside the four walls of the church, and to reach the least of these in his community, is he had put up this large banner, and this was the 80s, so everything was made bigger uh, and heavier in the 80s. If you've got anything from the 80s, you know that. Some of y'all don't even know what the 80s are. It makes me sick. But he had stretched this huge banner across the auditorium. He had Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 on there. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. He wanted the people in his body to understand That this was just not a place for them to come and sit, but that God had a calling and a plan and a ministry for them as a body of believers to reach the city. But he faced great resistance. And let me just tell you, let me just let you know, for those of you that are chasing hard after God's plan and will for your life, you will face resistance. Actually, resistance is an indicator that you're on the right path. It's an indicator that you're running in opposition to the enemy. And he faced great resistance within this body. And it just carried on. It felt like one step forward, two steps back, to the point that he had prayed and said, God, please just, you know, let me turn my resignation and just release me. And God had made it clear to him that he was to stay. And there were ladies in the church that were making life. I'm so thankful, so thankful, thankful for Element Church, man. Uh, this is not a hey, to Element Church's harm. It's, it's just, man, I'm thankful for the community that we have. I'm thankful for the absence of politics in church. But this was not the case for this young man and his wife. And so his wife was hurting. She was hurting And he got up on stage one day to preach the sermon, to stand in the fight and to be faithful. And he saw tears in his wife's eyes. He said, as he told Dr. Towns, as he stood at the pulpit before he opened the word of God, he heard the Holy Spirit speak clearly and say, I'm releasing you. I'm releasing you. And he said he, he didn't even start preaching. He looked over at his wife and said, Hey, sweetie, it's okay. I got a word from the Lord. We're released. 
So he didn't even wait to the end to give his resignation. He just gave it right at the beginning and said, hey, this is my last sermon. God's moving me on. I'm done after this service. And he preached the sermon. And the story goes, as he finished the sermon and went to step off that large stage, as he put his foot on that first step, there was this huge crash. And he said he turned to look to see what was happening. The banner with cables that had been stretched across the auditorium, Proverbs 29, 18, that said, where there is no vision, the people perish. The W had fallen off the banner and crashed into the drums. And he said as he looked back, the verse read, here there is no vision. The people perish. Man. Listen. There's a banner stretched over the lives of the people in this room listening online. One day you'll be done quenching the Holy Spirit. One day you will be done ignoring Him tugging upon the strings of your heart, calling you into the fight, calling you to finish what has started. One day it'll be over. I'm telling you, across this country and across this land, the W's are falling off the banners of churches. Just a couple of weeks ago, Jeremy and I sat with a, a church planner. And man, God has his hand upon his life and it's exciting to see. And they're meeting in homes and they're growing and they're just seeing the name of Jesus lifted high. They're seeing the captives set free and the chains broken and all the things that you want to see in a healthy, vibrant church. But they're getting to the point where they're, they're lacking room to meet and he's aware of a church in his community that has 13 members. Seating capacity of over 200, but there's only 13 people that gather every Sunday in this church. And so he reached out to them and said, hey, you know, I know y'all don't use your, your auditorium on Sunday nights. Could we, could we use your auditorium? We, we, would, we would pay you. We would bless you. And, man, we would come in and we would clean up after ourselves and you wouldn't know we were there. But we, we have this church that's growing, this new church plant's growing. And we're baptizing and people are getting saved and we just need more room to gather. 13 to 0. They voted to not let them use their space. I'm telling you, the W has fallen off. W has fallen off. Let it never be said of Element Church. Let it never be said of the individuals in this room and those listening online. Here, there is no vision. The people perish. Man, get in the fight. Get in the fight. Maybe you've been in the fight and you got out. Get back in the fight. We serve a God who is faithful to finish what he has started. He desires to finish what he started in your life. Number three, and we're going to close. And the worship team's going to come. We're going to just close with the time of ministry. The altar will be open. But I want us to notice the prescription for this winning the crown of righteousness. Put up a fight. Finish the race. Verse 7. Keep the faith. Hmm. Paul says keep the faith. There's a couple of implications to that. Paul's saying, listen, there's people that want to compromise doctrine. Can you imagine that? There were people already in the church, in the life of the church, some in it, some on the fringe around it, trying to influence the church, trying to talk the church into compromising doctrinal truth to suit culture. And Paul was warning Timothy of that. It's a scheme. It's a way the enemy works. You see, the enemy doesn't have a lot of new tricks, but he keeps doing the same things over and over and over again. And all he needs is for the people of God to withdraw, to give up, to get out of the fight. And he says, there's, there's coming a day, Timothy, when people will not endure sound doctrine. They want pastors and preachers who stand before them and tell them what they want to hear. And tell them that their choices and their decisions and the way that they live their life is okay, even though it doesn't line up with Scripture. 
Keep the faith. Paul was saying, Timothy, let culture crucify you before you compromise the authority of God's word. (laughs) Go to your grave. Do what he said to do or die trying. But also I want us to notice, and I think this is a word for us that we need to keep before us. Uh, 42, I feel like i got a lot of gas in my tank. After a day of volleyball for missions fundraising, I feel 42. And I realize I'm not young anymore. And every day I get a little older. I feel like I have a lot of gas in my tank still, ministry. But I also know this, I'm not promised tomorrow. But with his final words, Paul is keeping the faith by investing in that next generation. Man, we have to be a people. I know, I know I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting old too and I like things a certain way. Most of the time it's, I like things my way. But I have to be mindful and I have to invest in the next generation. We have to be mindful and we have to invest in the next generation. We have to be a people that are pouring into and raising up. Because when our race comes to an end, their race will continue. And quite frankly, we've done a poor job in the history of the church in North America of passing the baton. And my heart's desire for Element Church, a small town church, and a small town serving a big God, is when that day comes, to hand that off well. And to be able to give the charge, as Paul gave to Timothy, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith, go and do likewise. Every head bowed and every eye closed. As we, we close this service today, man, I just want to ask the question. you have some scars that you've been concealing. I'm talking about wounds. I'm talking about you've, you've walked in victory. You've been healed. I don't know why it is, but we, we just have a tendency. Maybe it's the culture. Maybe it's the enemy. Maybe it's part of us wishes we would have never made those mistakes and we don't really want to share. But you know right now the Holy Spirit is dealing with you that you have a story, that you have a past, that you have a message that you've been through some difficult stuff, but you felt the Holy Spirit telling you this morning, whispering in your ear, hey, your scars are beautiful. Quit hiding them. Stop hiding them. With nobody looking around, every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to pray for those individuals. I know you're in the room. And you're saying, I know. I know I need to move in obedience. I need to get into the fight. I need to be willing. Not to walk in shame over that. Not to walk in shame over those scars, but to celebrate them. See God's glory revealed and power displayed through them. If that's you, I just want to pray for you. Just lift your hand up. Let me pray for you. Yes, 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 yes. And maybe maybe you're here this morning and it's still an open wound. Can I tell you, he is faithful to heal. He is faithful to heal. He wants to heal those wounds and use the scars. But you have to come to him and you have to trust him. So I encourage you, the altar is open. I'll be down here, but you don't need me because you have the Holy Spirit. You do business with God. Don't leave here the same way that you walked in. If you have a word from God of your life, go and do it. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. God, I thank you. I thank you. God, I'm not capable. I'm not able. But I don't have to be. Because you're more than capable. You're more than able. Holy Spirit, break through the lies that the enemy tries to speak over the lives of people in this room. And let them know that their scars are beautiful and you have a plan to use them. Because your scars are beautiful. And you've had a plan to use them. Lord, we love you and we ask these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. You can stand to your feet as we, as we worship.